This reader interview is sponsored by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. Okay, happy days. We're ready. Okay, so today we have Cyan Greening calling to us from the bottom of the world. How you doing, Cyan? It really doesn't feel like the bottom of the world. It's a beautiful <laughs> sunny day here. So thanks to global warming, we're really enjoying winter. <laughs> yeah, we're, I think we're being lit from beneath, so that's probably why you're getting it. Yes, I think you are. Yes, we're just um, <laughs> crossing our fingers for bushfire season again. Oh, my. Yes. Oh, my. So, yeah, so what is it like? You're in New, uh, New South Wales, is that right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, I'm on the coast, um, so the eastern coast of, um, of Australia, so I'm in a seaside town. Oh, beautiful. We have 17 beaches and 11 working coal mines. So I sort of live on the side of a valley that goes down to, to the sea. And uh, that's why the this particular town was was established here was its huge um, coal reserves. Wow, it sounds idyllic. It really does. It is. It is absolutely beautiful. And if a bushfire comes down the hill, we'll just run out to sea and watch it burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, what could be prettier? <laughs> Actually, my house did burn down a few years ago. and Oh, and I'm sorry to hear that. An extraordinary sight, but um, yeah, it, not not pretty, not pretty. No, 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 that's not, I would imagine not. You can cut that out anyway. That, that's just, that you may find, you may find you have to cut a lot out. I'm a bit of a talker. <laughs> <laughs> I will cut out anything you ask. So are you ready to play the game? Yes, I am ready. All right. First encounter with a wolf story. Well, I was raised without much access to books, and that was because I was in a very strict religious cult. Oh, dear. And the only books we were allowed to read were, of course, the Bible, which I'd read cover to cover I don't know how many times now, particularly Revelations, because... um, it was a lot of eschatology, as there are in so many cults. Great training for reading a Gene Wolfe story, though. <laughs> yes. Yes, although um, there's a natural uh, reaction to almost a PTSD, I think, when you grow up in that fashion. It actually damages you quite badly. But I'm glad to say that um, because we didn't, we were absolutely forbidden from reading one word of the Apocrypha or the Kabbalah. You know, Gene Wolfe gets his work from a lot of biblical sources, but not the canon Bible, such as the names of the saints and the names of the angels. And so I'm glad to say it didn't, didn't trigger me. And what happened was I was, I actually, um, we all had to leave school fairly early to get jobs, um, you know, eight children in my family, wow. and we were lucky to be able to go to school. That was my mother couldn't be bothered homeschooling us as we were supposed to be, <laughs> so she um, had us in a public school. I read my way through the fantasy section of the library very secretly. We were only allowed two books at a time, and I had to hide them so. I'd often have another book hanging around and ready so that when I heard steps coming to my room, I could whip the fantasy or science fiction book under the pillow and be reading uh, a non-fiction book. We were allowed to read encyclopedias and so on. So when I got a job, I found Independence and actually found there was a public library. And at lunchtime, I just had time to run to the library go to the science fiction section, pick the two fattest books I could find because, again, and I don't know why this was, the library had a rule of only two books at a time. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it was because I was only 17. And, of course, I found, this is quite a miracle really, this plain blue old fat book, which was well, the, the all four books mm-hmm. of the New Sun found in one volume. The omnibus. It, it was it was extraordinary. So I took it home, and I immediately knew I was in a new world of reading. This was unlike anything I'd read, 
And the fact that I didn't understand a great deal of it didn't bother me at all because I was so used to reading things like revelations and so on. And I knew there were clues and keys, but it didn't actually bother me. I wasn't getting them all. I just knew this was the start of a love affair that was going to last forever. So every time I could get to the library, I would get that book out to the point where comments were made at the the library by the librarian and I actually had to buy myself a new handbag to disguise <laughs> that I was carrying around this enormous book and when I got home they eventually allowed me to get out four books so I'd bring out two books that were on subjects like science or very harmless there's a lot of Christian uh, fiction out there mm-hmm. dreadful <laughs> excuse me but dreadful stuff and I would pull those out and mum and dad would approve them. Oh. So I could then hide in my room saying I was doing homework or, or study or whatever and reading the book of the new son. And it wasn't until many years later, I just reread it. I read it. If I couldn't buy it. We didn't have the internet. Every bookshop in Christchurch in New Zealand where I was growing up had never even heard of Jean Wolfe so I just went back to the public library every year and read it um, sometimes every six months and read it again and read it and read it anyway we I I married you had to marry my marriage was arranged uh, for me I was allowed to marry a bit later at 21 because I was doing nursing training and there was a lot of discussion about whether I was allowed to be a nurse because you got to see parts, <laughs> parts of other people, parts right. of men in, in particular. Anyway, I, I was allowed to do nursing training and, um, <laughs> and so I was matched up with a doctor in the cult. Oddly enough, we're still married 34 years later. So Wow. Uh, yeah, I know. We we beat the odds. We both went over. We went to well, Thursday Island first of all, which is an island between Papua New Guinea and Australia, and started our our independence really. And it was our escape to get away from this cult. Although I was a, sort of an, a, a a forget the word. One thing I will say is I, I do have a little bit of difficulty with words sometimes I have a neurological condition and um, I sometimes get word blocks so oh. I'm doing my best though if I've practiced so that I don't <laughs> get too many instances of word block anyway I went to I I had to leave my beloved Jean Wolf when we started moving around the world and it wasn't until the beginning of the internet in Australia and We'd been living in Indonesia. Of course, there was no no internet there and, and no uh, libraries or anything. Oh, dear. I nearly died. And China and England and Dublin and so on. And the internet started to turn up. And then this amazing invention called the Kindle came along. Now, initially, Jean Wolfe's books were not available on Kindle And when I tried to order books from Amazon, they did not send to Australia at that time. So this is how long ago we're talking. So my brother, who is still in the cult, so I won't mention his name, actually went to live in the headquarters of the cult, which is in Arizona, and married appropriately there. They had a nice girl ready for him. And... um, He was occasionally able to get me a book and the very first purchases I made were, of course, the book of the new son, the four books as I thought of at the time. (laughs) And I discovered to my wonder that Jean Wolfe had written other books and since then, you know, I have several copies of them all. (laughs) They're on every device I own and I just still read them and... I actually uh, got very sick a couple of years ago and was in intensive care for a couple of weeks and came out with brain damage, which was, yeah, changed everything. I 
by that time I'd um, qualified as a genetic counsellor and I'd been working as a genetic counsellor for about 15 years because it really interested me. I'd done a lot of palliative care and I started to get traumatised. When the trauma starts, you have to get out. So I got out and I wanted to do something where that was going to prevent people from getting cancer. So I actually trained as a hereditary cancer. Uh, that was my specialty in genetic counselling. Anyway, when I got sick, everything disappeared. I think about that time I even dropped off the Gene Wolfe Appreciation Society because I just, I actually couldn't remember anything. Oh. And I had to start from the start. So um, not not uh, it wasn't total amnesia, but huge blocks. But I could remember the book of the New Sun because I'd read it so often <laughs> at a young age. It was burned into me. So it was a an interesting discovery. And, and a wonderful day for me, you know, discovering that he's written other books. I slowly collected them all and devastated that I discovered him right at the end of his career because otherwise I would have done anything to get, if I could, <laughs> to go to a Comic-Con or something and meet this god. Yeah. Oh, he was, he was every bit as nice as you would have hoped him to be. Yeah. Well, don't, now that's I think that's a tease, James. That's a real tease. But I, I, I actually, <laughs> oh no, I, I I I had lunch with him a couple of times actually. That was which was really really nice. Oh, wonderful! And I've I have seen him several times in in conventions on panels and in groups. And he's, I mean, I remember one time he was the only person on the panel. He was the only person there. There wasn't even a moderator, and oh. it was just and everyone you know was a little starstruck. And so he's, you know, he's, he's prompting everyone and, mm. you know, he, he's basically coming up with questions for himself and it, yeah, it was very good. He's, he was just really nice guy. Well, you, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's how I happened on his books and um, they remain for me a Mount Everest point in my life, really, the discovery of that book. And the knowledge that there were there was other things out there, the freedom to think outside of the cult was something he, well, I was yearning for. That's why I'd started reading science fiction and fantasy. We were, there was some disagreement, but we were approved to read Narnia after a while. And so <laughs> I immediately, you know, had read Narnia and, that sort of started this dream that there could be other worlds where people weren't as unhappy as I was because I was incredibly unhappy. Have you read the Book of the Long Sun? Yes, I love the Book of the Long Sun. Absolutely love it. I, I really, I can't read it enough. Yeah, you know, Jean uh, referred to that as a story about a good man in a bad religion. That is so, I relate to it so much and... I just, I love silk. Mm -hmm. I really, silk is the person you want to find in churches. Right. And you don't. I've never met silk. No. He's just, he is my patron saint, apart from Gene Wolfe <laughs> <laughs> himself, <laughs> who I've, you know, unbeknown to any other church who I've actually elevated to sainthood. <laughs> Well, what is your favorite? It's, I, I suspect I know. And in which case, if it's the Book of the <laughs> New Sun, then tell me why it's your favorite. Well, I think a more interesting question, she said very cheekily, I would love to hear <laughs> what people's second favorite is and watch them squirm. Because <laughs> the Book of the New Sun is, like I said, it, it is the Everest of books. And... To me, it's like looking at the ranges and seeing the peak of Mount Everest surrounded by these other peaks which aren't as high. But I have a couple of favourites. Obviously, everyone's going to say the Book of the New Sun because I, I can't compare it to anything else. I think that was his life's work in terms of the puzzles and the mysteries and the symbolism that he put into that book. And uh, before I got ill, um, I love, 
I, and still do the book of the long term, the short term, you know, love them. Yeah, really feeling that Silk is a character and the idea of artificial gods is very appealing to me and I just love the way it's written. I really do. But when I was recovering from, I went into bone marrow failure, which uh, filled my, my chest filled with fluid and my heart was compressed. And I'd been developing a neurological condition, this chronic pain, this mystery chronic pain, chronic fatigue, feeling worse and worse. I thought I was just having a really bad day. I remember trying to walk to work and holding onto a fence and pulling myself up. I mean, I woke up in intensive care. I was in there for about three weeks and then in hospital for another four weeks or so and then in rehab for six weeks. And the book that I could only read then was There Are Doors. And I don't know why. There was something about it that made sense in this new brain I was struggling with. And it's a funny old-fashioned book in some ways. It's said a battered noir almost. It's sort of this 1950s era you know, and I just picked that up. And that's where I had to restart because I know I couldn't work out peace anymore, for instance. I had to actually, you know, intellectually relearn peace and other books like that. So, yeah, I'd love to know what people's second favourite is. If we took Book of the New Sun out of the running, where would people come in then? I'm going to have to do that. That's a good idea. I've actually avoided your question because... The, the Wizard Knight say, I could read as I recovered. And so I read that several times because it was much more straightforward. I didn't have to struggle. I was struggling greatly with memory. <laughs> I was a letro. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I suppose I've, I've wiggled around the question a little bit by saying that I think almost you have to remove the Book of the New Sun from that question because it's so overwhelming and it casts I wouldn't say it's shadow it's light over all of everything he wrote well let me give this a shot you don't have to you don't have to give the second favorite what are if I took book of the new sun off the off the the choice your top three top three novels or stories oh top, oh now you're really getting me um Definitely Long Sun. Mm -hmm. For some reason, I have a great affection for the sorcerer's, get, a sorcerer's house. I don't know why. I um, I, I just – that's a really fun read for me. I really yeah, is, enjoy reading that. Yeah. And, oh, Lord, you really caught me short with number three. <laughs> cruel, cruel. Um, <laughs> I want to say peace. I think I'm going to have to say peace. Yeah, oh, it's a beautiful one. Yeah. 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 You So you had mentioned to me off mic that there was another man that, that you almost married, but it didn't work out. I would like to hear that story. <laughs> Part of the cult I was in uh, did have arranged marriage in that no dating was allowed at all. We did go out as a group, all the, the youth group were allowed to go out together, but there was no touching allowed in any way. And so, and of course, with an equivalent pressure to marry early, they had developed a system of actually matching up people. So the pastor's son, as it happened, wanted to be matched up with me until uh, I, w I was 17. And... I then entered nursing school and he rethought that because I'd be no longer a virgin in his eyes. <laughs> that is really remarkable. Uh, yes, I, I would be. You've been spoiled. You've been tainted. You, you know too much. Literally spoiled. I was tainted. He spoke those very words to me. Wow. That I was tainted because I had seen naked men. Not that they were very exciting. <laughs> no man was critically ill 
is um, sexually exciting. <laughs> so you can cut that bit out if you want. <laughs> I, I, I don't think anyone's going to debate that issue. So. <laughs> he came to see me. We were allowed time alone with my parents in the next room. And he told me that he no longer wished to to be partnered with me. To my intense relief, I will say, and I will say that my father would have refused the match. He would have been in a lot of trouble for doing that because, of course, the approved match was approved by God because if it was approved by the minister, it was approved by God himself. There was another young man who wished to be partnered with me, but he was too shy to come forward. He felt I was too far above him in intellect or whatever. And in fact, he was a far nicer person. And if I'd had the choice, I would have married him. Uh, and none of this is, is I had no, um, <laughs> no involvement in these early processes. So I ended up marrying a man who just sort of wandered by and was looking at different churches. And he was very innocent in many ways about the what goes on. He was Catholic. His friend met a friend. All cults are very good at recruitment. And he said, come along, this is church. It's really friendly. People people just surround you with love. They're, they're great. They're, they're wonderful. So uh, my to be husband, actually, I um, nothing was was done for a year, and then my father set up the match because he was a doctor, or was there were there other good reasons? Yeah, well, it was partly that. It was partly the fact that my my husband to be had questioned my father. It was on a youth camp about how you can be intelligent on one hand and believe all the things he was supposed to believe. On the other hand, he found it difficult. <laughs> and my dear father, he said, I have a very intelligent daughter, and she has no trouble accepting everything in the cult. You should meet her. She's up there on the stage playing the piano. So we both got accidentally put, accidentally, I say, put on cleaning roster together. And I was very shy because you are trained to not address men unless they address you first. But I actually did speak first and asked his opinion on a piece of doctrine, which of course he knew nothing about. And <laughs> <laughs> he eventually went to the elders and asked for permission to court me. And after six months... He went to the elders and asked for permission to hold my hand and go out on day dates. And once physical contact was made in the form of hand-holding, you were on a railway train. This was expected to be preliminary to marriage. And so we had a very short engagement and were married off quite quickly. And that was just the way of it. That is just that is just a, a just a really really remarkable story, and it's almost it's, I mean, it's it's really amazing. <laughs> I'm trying to think what the elders were thinking. Well, we might as well let this new guy come in because you know she's spoiled goods anyway, <laughs> and we have to <laughs> we, we have to, we got to we got to pawn her off on somebody. <laughs> exactly, and he was spoiled goods in a way. Mm -hmm. The, the same restrictions weren't placed on men, but the fact that he was a doctor and also seen na naked people seemed... Yeah, he was his, he was in the same terrible place as you, so... Yeah, yeah we can get rid of this problem, this small <laughs> dots, because it's not right to remain single. Right. And for women, it is... Some men can plead to remain single, and, yeah, he... <laughs> It's a story that you think comes from the Middle Ages but is still happening today Yeah, in many areas. And I'm not even talking about different cultures. I'm talking about the Western world. And I recently met a couple, actually, who were very, very distressed because their eldest daughter had been matched to a much, much older man. He was 20 years older and they had no say 
Mm. Whereas I would have made a run for it, I think, in the end, if that had happened to me. But fortunately, my husband and I had a lot in common and we'd managed to make a success of it. No marriage is easy, but we've stuck together. And in doing so, we have left the cult together. We gave each other the, the courage. He gave me the courage, actually. I'll give him the benefit for that to, to leave the cult, despite... Yeah, but it turns out it was a great match. Well, it was. And, and it was terrifically painful to break relationships with my family and so on. And yes, he had to swap me through that. Sure. Um, yeah, so not a story you hear very often, but oddly enough, I do tie that story very closely to Jean Wolfe. And that's why I've told the story, not to just say, look at me, I had a strange experience, but to say that reading the book of the new son at 17 opened the key in something in my mind that there were other schools of thought out there that there were people who could do these wild things with books not just Narnia they could actually do this you know these things where I knew instinctively that I wanted to be part of right well I it is remarkable to have for well I'm always kind of amazed at young people that that take to Wolf so quickly but to have you know a young girl in a well I mean I, I say you know say a, a um, extraordinary circumstances but you know Wolf's Wolf's worlds are mm. extraordinary mm. so maybe that's not even so strange but it's interesting that that would be the that that's the book that's the book I, I'd read Isaac Asimov I'd read you know the usual Philip Dick the, the usual sorts of things, but there was no connection to my situation in those books. And I don't know why Severian would, uh, Severian's world would have spoken to me so much except for the quality of the writing. Well, you know, after the fact, it kind of, there is some kind of parallel. You know, uh, Severian has to betray his own family and and religion in the tower and believe me it was a betrayal it was a terrible betrayal yeah and he feels like well you know that that meeting he had with Vodalus that was the first step in everything else that happened yes I mean the way he looked at Vodalus and instantly knew right this is what I want we don't know what it we knew he had some information about Vodalus before but he looks at him and says this is the way I'm going. Right. Very instantly, with no pros and cons, questioning, I looked at Jean Wolfe and said, this is the life I want. Do you understand what I mean by that saying? This is the sort of person I want to be, the sort of person who will stroll into a library, pick up a Jean Wolfe and feel at home. Right, yeah. That was my yearning, and uh, I am fortunate enough. And without Wolf, for some reason it was Wolf, because I think because of the similarity of the the eschatology and so on, where he looked at it from such a different viewpoint, that I was able to accept that there could be different ideas, that there was no one dogma about the world. I I didn't actually tell anyone until I was about the age of 40 that I had been in a religious cult. I felt great shame about it, that I had been sucked in even though my family joined when I was the age of six. I felt personal shame about it and would not speak of it because people treated me as a freak afterwards and and asked the questions I wasn't quite prepared to answer, whereas I'm confident enough now to answer those questions and to say what went on. And and I'm not going to bore your readers with what went on, but you can imagine it's exactly as as many other cults, the the sexual things, the the physical punishments, uh, the uh, in fact the spiritual punishments, which were harder because 
you were put with a demon to be punished and that was far uh, I actually related to when Jonas and uh, Severian are in the dark underground antechamber in the house absolute and suddenly whips and horrible faces appear to the, and to the point that they destroy Jonas in many ways and that surprisingly is one of the analogies for me of being in a cult is its darkness with the unexpected whips. I was often unexpectedly, you know, going about my business or, or asleep and hit awake for a perceived sin that I'd been part of. And you could not think of a more sinless girl than I was. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that just please edit what you want. I'm just talking as a friend. I, I, I look on you as, as a friend, you know, because you've listened to me and respected my, my opinions, which I really appreciate. I appreciate more than many people you know because I lived for so long without being allowed to speak. St. Paul says, let the women be silent in the church. And that was literal. Literal. You were not allowed to speak at the moment until you left the doors. And it was far more terrifying than I can actually convey as an adult when you're young. I think, you know, with magical thinking and children and so on. So edit out all these little waffles at the end, but um, use what you wish. You're going to sound great, and I can't wait for people to hear this story. It's going to be great. So I really appreciate it. It's uh, Look, I do too because it, it shows once again that I've gained the courage to step back and say I am not part of that anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just tell you one really weird thing. Part of... When I finally made the statement, I am no longer part of this, it, with the help of my psychotherapist, 9-11 <laughs> happened the next day, hmm. and I actually thought for a few seconds... That you'd done it. <laughs> ...that I had done that. <laughs> Seriously, this is the, the degree of brainwashing. I do not talk about this experience very often because... It, it's intensely private, but not in a way that I, I'm actually willing for it to go out to the readers because I think maybe they are a group who might actually not judge me for what I've gone through. Oh, no, I... I think there's. I think this could help people. This is really good. If anything, I do could. I mean, that's why I went into nursing eventually when I was allowed to, was the only way out of this... I found was to be a person of service. So I've spent my life being a person of service, as in, you know, the nursing, the genetic counseling. I was helping people. It was very, very important to me. And so, um, unfortunately, having to leave all that has left me with another question you know, how do I become a person of service when I can't work? But that's just another journey I'm on. And I am 54 years old, James, and I'm still actually trying to get over the the values that were inculcated in me at that age. And it's it's not fair. It's very, very wrong. I am, I'm so against religion. I, I'm not against belief in God at all. I'm not against spirituality but I am against the church and religion because, after all, it is only ever a human, a human interpretation of what God thinks. And, of course, they happen to be the person who God is speaking to and telling these things if there, if there be a God, you know. To, to have, have a life like that presented as religion, what could be less right than to have that perspective on religion? having grown up with, with that is, as the def definition of yeah. religion. Yeah. So I'm sorry to talk again so long, 
it's, it's hard to know what to put in and what to put out. And so I've given you a bit of a job in terms of editing. Yeah. Oh, you've given me so much. To, oh, it's like there's so much gold, so much to work with. <laughs> <laughs> You're so lovely. To, to speak of this as gold, when to me it has been dross, <laughs> that gives me value to my life because instead of thinking it as a wasted life, it just I, I comfort myself by thinking I am the person I am and I believe I am a good person. I, I am certainly... I've, I was certainly a very good nurse uh, and a very good genetic counsellor to a new and me I won several awards and, you know, those sorts of things because of what it feels like to be on the other side. And perhaps I needn't regret it. It took a long time to get to that point not to regret it, but I'm 54 now and I still have moments where I regret it and I still have moments I thought unfortunately I um it just really got through it and a lot of work I, I had felt that freedom and then I got sick about five years later and since then I have been very ill so I had very little time to make the most of what I had and that is the biggest pain in my life. Well, you're kind of actually a, a Gene Wolfe character, aren't you? Because so many of his characters are dealing with the issues of memory and its relation to identity. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's if there was a common thread, that's possibly it. It's ironic, I guess, considering what his oeuvre is about. It is. I'm not the same person I was. I mean, the experiences I've had in my life have affected me too much to the point where I could ever set myself up to really say anything definitively because, odd enough, I have no belief in astrology, but I am a Libran. <laughs> I just cannot stop weighing the scales. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that, that was something I enjoyed about medicine. It, there were answers often in medicine where evidence could be put together. And an answer could be found in a lot of cases, but there are a lot of mystery cases out there as well. So they were also very frustrating. So, yeah, I have learnt to live with ambivalence, certainly in terms of my own health, a mystery disease, yeah. which I think about 15 specialists for, and it's going downhill. Oh, dear. So I'm not sure of my lifespan. So I don't want to waste any time having arguments or anything like that on a personal level. Uh, when I read Jean Wolf, I just immerse myself in what feels like a warm spa mm -hmm. and, sure. and read away. And that's why they're just sitting there on my shelf. And I've, I actually, after the fire where... My library actually exploded. I had a huge library and um, I watched it actually burn and it, it, there were books exploding everywhere. There were just sheets and sheets coming around and I actually transferred my library to Kindle after that. I, I just couldn't bear the thought of all that fuel sitting in the house. But I couldn't. I, I had to give in and after a while um, there are very few authors but there's... Of course, Jean Wolfe is number one where I've actually bought copies. I just had mm. to have the physical copy yeah. in my hand. You can get rid of that. That's, yeah. that's not very important. Oh, I, I would never. <laughs> 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 Unless you've just abandoned it, I'm not going to. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I, I got to tell you, Cyan, you have the most beautiful origin story for Jean Wolfe that I've done so far. And that is just really beautiful. That's really nice to hear. I think that after coming out of such horror, it's what you make of it afterwards and how you can become very bitter. I've met a lot of people who are very traumatised, very bitter, very angry, even people very close to me. And I made a very conscious decision that I wasn't going to go that way. And I was going to be a person who saw both sides, ten sides of everything that was out there and I just enjoyed it for what it was just living in the contentment that is my aim in life is contentment and to be content while reading a Jean Wolfe 
is what I'm happy to be. I don't need the answers, but I love dwelling on the possibilities. He is, as I say, he is my patron saint. <laughs> okay, let's try the next one. Favorite wolf word. I really liked the concept of and the word of the palerines, mm -hmm. uh, which you would think that it was, it was the idea of a, a, a religion that actually did something mm -hmm. and without demand. And these women were, I or and men were sacrificing themselves for the greater good, and the word palerines seemed to describe that very much. And and even though it's actually named after a piece of clothing that they wore. Right. It's it's no deeper than that. But for some reason, I, I did like that. Diana's already met, bit, met, you know, she's she's bit bit the chase by picking the pan creator and the increate as words that I think are wonderful as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, pelerines, it's just, it, it's just a very nice lilting word. I like it. Yeah, I just I think it, it it's it's a very peaceful word and it's, it describes what they do. I do like that, and I don't know how to pronounce it. Are they NPLs? A N P I E L S. You know the the angels who come down and help out. Yeah, um, I think they're very interesting characters. As like NPLs, I don't know. I, I don't I don't know how else you would say it. That's about that's as good as a. I've never said it out loud yet, so. But from a from a Kiwi living in Australia, that's how it's pronounced in my in my mind. Yeah, that's another word I like. Looks right. A personal, non consensus theory about a wolf story, or your favorite one. Well, I was confused about the life cycle of the the sun in the book of the the uh, new sun if the sun appears to be a red dwarf it's cool it's large it's red red dwarf how could our sun turn into a red dwarf i mean the only the only way it's going to go anywhere is is a, a um you know not not a dwarf anyway it's going to be a, a red sun but it's going to be much much larger in fact probably right. mm -hmm. end up um, swallowing several of the inner planets, including Earth, and before it shrinks again. So the only you can't really make sense of that without saying that something very unnatural has happened to the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, now we don't. Uh, I don't. I'm not an astronomer, but and but even astronomers would admit that they're, they're finding new things all the time and so on. But I think that. Um, uh, my, I, I don't know if this is original. It's very uh, strange coming in where some people have been studying the books for 40 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And was, they've got this huge history of being, you know, the very early internet and before that early discussion groups. And they've had years and years and years and years to look at these things. Whereas I've had just my lifetime. And that was always the thing that struck me was how the sun got to be a red dwarf. Um, and so, into some interference seems to have happened to the sun. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't think of why the cacogens, as we could call them, would, would do that. I mean, what, what motivation would they have? In fact, that sort of links into my bigger question of why are they so interested in our world and specifically Severian because they know Severian is going to be Severian and why out of all of the universe, which they seem to have at their tips, are they so interested in our world specifically? Is this something they do going around, you know, um, nurse-mating worlds into new forms of themselves or... You know, because there's certainly nothing special about Earth, that's for sure. Was it they who turned the sun into a red dwarf when it really shouldn't have been a red dwarf until it had completely destroyed the Earth? And my other question, which you can edit out <laughs> if it's going too long, is did, 
Are we living in an alternative universe? Because there are things that have um, remained, and I'm thinking of early Christianity, whereas other things there seems to be no residuum from, such as, well, if you're talking religion, Buddhism, Hindu, Muslim, you know, where are all the names from those religions? And why are they sort of back to living some sort of pseudo medieval life, you know, traveling around on a creature like a horse and having a creature like a dog? You know, th- these people are actually pre technology. Did, did we split off sometime after the early church? If so, where are St. Joseph, St. Mary, St. Anne, and Jesus Christ himself? Yeah, so just another question there that I've got. And I have no idea whether these questions are original or not because I haven't been subject to it. I, if I had, I wouldn't remember <laughs> the, you know, the early discussions about those sorts of mysteries. Well, I have discovered that every question has been asked before. And before I got to it, they have fought wars over it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to start. I remember what we've discussed before is that I think he was talking to Neil Gaiman. And it, one thing he said was that the answers never satisfy, but the mysteries, they never go away. And the other thing was, he says, you know, people ask me all these questions like they want answers, but what they really want is for me to settle their fights. So, <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> strongly reminded by that when we were talking about Morwenna's execution in Claw the Conciliator. There's no consensus about anything. We ended up with three very strong positions. And that is a relatively straightforward anecdote in the book, you would think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't I don't actually want answers particularly, although I enjoy discussion, but I wouldn't get to the point of argument over it. That's that's not me. Um, I think there are far more important things to argue over. In fact, I almost think there's, especially after um, about 10 years as a palliative care nurse, I think it, by the end of life, there is nothing worth arguing over. There, there is always mystery, though, and that's what I love, is the continuing mystery and the way people keep digging new mystery out of what, what for instance, I thought was a fairly straightforward anecdote and I understood <laughs> quite well until I listened to that podcast and staggered away. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was amazed. And I changed my mind about it after hearing, yeah, I picked a different side. Well, I think that's a, a good way to be, isn't it? Once you, you speak to your guns, you're, you're talking dogma. And I have had enough dogma to last me for my entire life. I mean, you have no idea how much doctrine I know and how every single verse of the Bible was pulled apart and argued about and there really was a lot of bitterness in the arguing and someone had to win. That was the nature of the church. So I'm talking back to my early days in the cult. Someone had to win and that led to split after split after split. So every church of the cult is an individuality in its thinking of particularly the revelations found in the book of Revelation which is a clue book for the end of the world. In fact, for the time we're living now, because the seventh pro- there were seven prophets and the seventh prophet supposedly has now died. And so we're living in the time of revelations. And um, it, the, when things get really tense and hostile, I really shrink back. I, I find that quite difficult. Yeah, I, it's just left over trauma really from that sort of argument where we were cast out of one church and into how officially our whole family was lined up the front of the church because my father had a different interpretation of a doctrine so that particular church we had to line up at the front be officially taken out from under the protection of the holy spirit and given over unto the devil for his punishments. And this sounds ridiculous and laughable, but when you're 11 years old, I was genuinely terrified. I actually thought uh, we were going to die. I thought the house would burn down. We would die in a car accident. Uh, I lived my life in fear, and I actually still have 
high anxiety levels as an adult despite quite a lot of psychotherapy so you can be changed forever for good or for bad from your early childhood experiences that's for sure well i think it's telling that i asked for a personal theory and all you had was questions which is i think uh, i think uh, appropriate I, I wouldn't be um, vain enough to actually come up with a theory to say, I've worked it out. <laughs> I would... Oh, well, you're talking to the wrong person here. <laughs> <laughs> no, but given relative lack of knowledge and experience, and people just know so much when I listen. Yeah, I listen to Mark Aramini. I listen to you guys on the podcast. I read people on the, on Facebook, and I... People know so much about these books that it's it's actually really intimidating. I remember the day I first put an entry on the Gene Wolfe Appreciation Society and was actually shaking. I was so scared to make a suggestion because it is really intimidating because the the group is made up of people who, who've already read these books so many times. Or you don't have to be a huge expert to have a strong opinion about it. And that's often true in church, too. <laughs> you would have to. You'd have to have a lot of confidence. Yeah, you, that you had found all primary sources and it somehow got into Gene Wolfe's brain and altered them because I genuinely believe he was a literary genius. And I know whereof I speak. I've Two of my brothers are tested geniuses. Two of my nephews are. I'm, I'm surrounded by them and I know what geniuses are like and I have to say there's a lot of very intelligent people discussing this but it's only ever going to be a hypothesis and that humbles us all or it should. No, no, that's absolutely <laughs> true. Okay, so you have a lot of questions. Let me ask you, let me try to go for this because it's the last question. What is the most frustrating, Is there, if there are any for you, most frustrating mystery in a wolf novel or story? I do think that's the, the person of Valeria. Valeria, yes. We know she's, she's beautiful. Severian feels instantly some kind of bond with her. And she seems to be so glad to see him, but I think that's her loneliness as well. I look forward to seeing what more you draw out of the mystery of Valeria because she really is more, and I know we've spent a lot of time on Thecla, but the moment he becomes the autarch, he really has a priority to go straight to Valeria he goes back to her. He doesn't talk about her hardly at all until the very end of Shadow, right? Very limited. He calls her the forgotten girl uh, in the atrium. Yeah. But his esteem for her just kind of grows. Every time he mentions her after that, it's the most beautiful woman in the world, Valeria. It's, And he comes back. He doesn't even know who she is. She's just a girl yeah. in an event of his life a couple years earlier. Now, we can either interpret that as... Severian is very shallow and chooses a life partner on the basis of beauty or we can look deeper and say something happened to him. Yes, yeah. That when he met Valeria that she formed such a, a relationship or, or, or an impression on him that he very quickly goes to fetch her. There is no question that that, that she will be his autarchia. Interestingly and frustratingly, he says nothing, or, or Wolf chooses, as she says nothing, about their meeting, their discussion, what will be their early life. And if there's... <laughs> I think I must be a, a romantic because... I would have liked to see that. I would have liked to, to be a part of that, to, to be a fly on the wall and to see when he met Valeria and when he went back and how he persuaded her that she should spend a lifetime with him. No, no, I, 
we, we talk a lot more about Agia than I thought we were going to. Well, I think we're going to talk. I know we're going to talk a lot about Valeria as we go through these books. She's going to come up. I'm, I'm looking forward to that so much because we've talked a lot about Thekla. Mm-hmm. We've talked a lot about Agia. In fact, more than, as you say, as I thought, because she seemed to almost a deus imagine it where she you know led to the acquirement of the claw right but we know severian is very inexperienced with women so you know the first few attractive women he sees he's he's going to respond to but <laughs> valeria he refers to her as the forgotten girl and i find that very mysterious particularly for for severian who forgets nothing Exactly. And you <laughs> spoke about the atrium of time and how it's in time. But Valeria herself seems to be easily bought out of time. We hear little more of her after a very, fairly brief conversation, which is a little strange. There was nothing romantic in that description. And I refuse to believe that Severian would say, she's beautiful, I'll go and get her. Well, his his reaction to her is not anything like his first reaction with Thecla, for instance. And yeah, I mean, he's just blown away by Thecla. But with her, you know, she's just, she's some girl in the neighborhood. It's really interesting. She's antique. Yeah. Which is (laughs) never a word I have heard. (laughs) I think if I had a young man come to me and say, I'd like to go out with you, your antique <laughs> would be. <laughs> uh, well, we all know he's quite the charmer. so. <laughs> well, it, it would be unexpected, to say the least. would certainly get to my interest. And even when in book five, he speaks of Valeria less than I would expect yeah, it's it's just a mystery to me. So, you know, I, I, I don't know if that struck anyone else or, or it's because I'm one of the few females that seems to appear as being vocal and, and having read Gene Wolfe and loved Gene Wolfe. But I always look out for the female characters. I don't know how many of your listeners have had that reaction where you see a woman and you just an instant reaction you know that this is someone i'd like to know better but to actually use the resources of the empire and to roar over just to pick up valeria is very bold and i don't know what wolf is telling us there i think it's it could be a tribute to rosemary and um yeah very interesting about Valeria. So I, I will be looking forward to your ongoing insights into Valeria. I, look, I have to admit, I still don't fully understand the fifth book of The New Sun. Uh, I, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I really... Yeah, I know. I'm sorry. This is this is my nature. I think this is how I've I've learned to be because I was raised in an atmosphere of dogma, and it took me a long while to shake that off and become an agnostic deist. <laughs> if you can work that one out, I can't give you an answer on that one because I'm so frustrated at times <laughs> by my own significant loss of brain power. But I've never really understood. Initially, peace was my, it was just, I was at the end of my tether with peace, to be honest. Fortunately, a lot has been written about peace that's opened it up for me. But I still feel there's there's mysteries I don't understand in um, the fifth book, as I call it, I can tell myself, the fifth book. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much for doing this, Cyan. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I really thought I had nothing to offer because I have so little knowledge compared to everyone else. But I guess <laughs> mine has been more of a personal or deeply personal experience. Yeah, well, that's it's great. It's great. Thank you. This is great. This was sponsored entirely by the patrons of the Rereading Wolf podcast. 
You can go to patreon.com slash rereadingwolf to play a part in bringing other amazing things like this into the world. And if you want to take on the five questions with us, reach out by email or by one of the other methods listed in the show notes to this episode. 